All right, welcome back. Uh, today we are going to begin looking at Chapter 6 of Campbell's Biology, a Tour of the Cell. So Concept 6.1, biologists use microscopes and the tools of biochemistry to study cells. So let's go back a step further here and recognize that cells are the fundamental unit of life. All right, so there are some organisms that are just a single cell. And that is it. We, much more complex creatures, are made up of actually a collection of many, many cells. If you take a look at the features of these cells and look at complex organisms versus more simplistic ones, you can, you can begin to see how they're related and that uh, different organisms may have descended from each other. Now, despite the fact that many cells can differ uh, greatly from one another, even within our own bodies, looking at uh, bone cells versus skin cells um, versus neural cells, very, very different things, they all share some common features. Now, first thing to consider is that cells are typically too small to be seen by the naked eye. There are um, some exceptions to this. Um, human egg cells kind of approach uh, where you might be able to see it uh, with just a magnifying lens. Um, there are definitely some larger egg-based um, cells where you can, if you consider all the storage material to be part of the cell, then yeah, you can see that single cell. So, microscopes are used to visualize these cells, and there are several different flavors of microscopes. To start off with, we have something called a light microscope. This essentially utilizes light passing through an object, and then it's focused through a series of glass lenses in order to magnify the image. So, the lenses refract or bend the light, magnifying it to allow us to take very small things and make them appear bigger. There are several parameters when we start thinking about um, microscopy that we need to consider. Okay, Number one is magnification. This is how large something is relative to what its real size is. Resolution, this is the ability to measure the clarity of an image or be able to see two distinguishable points as two objects. As resolution goes down, you lose that ability. And then there's contrast. So sometimes we might be able to see um, something through a microscope, but not be able to really differentiate its parts and this can come down to contrast. Now, um, depending on how big things are, we have different styles of um, microscopy that we can utilize. Um, if we're talking about anything uh, on the macro scale down to um, larger cells or eggs in specifically, we can see those with the unaided eye. Now down here in this range, maybe we can't see them very well. So we can start use, utilizing lenses to make things look bigger. And this works for a range down to about um, where we can see bacteria. As we start getting smaller than bacteria, we start losing resolution and we start losing the ability to actually see individual things. Um, this is where we need to move into something called electron microscopy. And we'll talk about why that is here in a moment. Let's first start off with light microscopes. All right. So here is what we call a basic bright field image. 
right? So we have cells sitting under a microscope, light shining through it, and this is what we see. One of the first things you'll notice is it's kind of hard to see where the border of the cell is, or we can't see really any internal features. This is a contrast issue, right? So we can make the light brighter and brighter and brighter, but eventually the light coming through makes it almost impossible to actually see any of the light that is changed by the samples going through. One way to improve this is by utilizing stains. So stains are small um, molecular entities that have coloration. We can, uh, they oftentimes will have the ability to bind something specifically, like maybe they can bind proteins, maybe they can bind fats, maybe they can bind something else. In doing so, we can highlight particular features of the cell. Right, so this increased contrast allows us to see more over here in a stain sample than we can in just bright scope. There's limitations here. Typically, when we stain things, we kill it in the process. So there are other techniques that we can use to try and increase this contrast issue without actually killing the cells. There are a couple of specific techniques, but this all falls into um, what we call phase contrast type of imagery. And what happens here is when light passes through something like a bacteria, it moves ever so slightly out of phase with the light that's just shining through the background. Here we're representing light as a wave, and you can see here's a peak of the wave in the background light. And here is the peak of the wave that's coming through an object. So there's a slight shift. Well, we can essentially take a plate that has the ability of shifting light even further and amplify that difference to the point where um, the waveforms are actually opposite each other. So here we have a peak and or a crust, and here we have a trough. When they overlap, they kind of cancel each other out. This allows us to shine more light through a phase contrast microscope, but not have it look like we're just staring into a flashlight, right? So the background here is slightly dark. And utilizing this technique, any slight variation in this phase shift will appear as a as a difference. So here we can kind of see the edges of the cells, we can see the nucleus, we can see that there are things within. And as I said, there's a couple different ways that we can um, utilize this type of technology. Another way that we can utilize this is through something called fluorescence. So if you recall, fluorescence is when we take one light um, energy and it's coming in at a particular wavelength. We typically use non visible light that will be absorbed by electrons. The electrons will jump up a shell, then they'll drop back down, and then they'll release that energy as light. This isn't 100% efficient. You lose a little bit of energy along the way. So, consequently, the light emitted is slightly longer in wavelength. So this is invisible to us, this is visible to us. Utilizing different dyes that have the ability to absorb ultraviolet light gives us the ability to see things um, essentially on a black background. That way we can shine even more light through. Here we're actually utilizing lasers. And you can imagine if you stare into a laser, that is not a good thing. But here, we can utilize the laser to um, pick up on these fluorescent molecules, and we can bind these fluorescent molecules to different things based upon their biochemical properties. Another thing uh, that we need to consider when we're talking about utilizing ultraviolet energy is the wavelength of light is going to impact how small of something that we can see. So if we look at, like, here's a visible light spectrum, 
and it has a particular wavelength range. The shorter the wavelength, the more blue it appears. The longer, the more red. And here in infrared radiation, or infrared light, it's actually the, the wavelength is the width of a human hair. Now you can imagine if light is passing through something and its wavelength is longer than the object itself, the light pretty much pretends that the object isn't there. So when we're using visible light, we have limitations, a hard limitation on how small something can be. As we move into the ultraviolet spectrum, we can see even smaller. So utilizing this ultraviolet light both gets rid of the background light, but also allows us to get, see even smaller. This will come back in a major way when we start talking about um, either X-ray technology or um, electron ray technology, which allows us to see, see even smaller. Now, another thing that we can do <coughs> is recognize that when we're looking at an image, we are seeing everything in a cell, both the surface of the cell, then in the interior of the cell, and then in the background of a cell. And that actually gives us what we see down here, this little blurred mess. Okay, so there's a technique that we can use where we take the light and pass it through a very small hole, and that allows us to see only light coming from a particular plane in um, a sample. So here, instead of seeing the light in the background, in the light in the foreground, and the light in the middle, here with confocal technology, we are only looking at the light coming from the middle. Uh, I can explain this a little bit further in class. There is also a technology that we call deconvolution. And here, instead of utilizing light passing through a tiny hole, we essentially use mathematical equations to back calculate where light must have originated from, and then strip away any light that we're not interested in. And you can see this gives us a much sharper image. Confocal gives us a much sharper image. So you can imagine if you combine the two, you can see at things at very high resolution, okay? Much higher than the light actually allows for us, but utilizing uh, mathematics, we can make it appear better. Um, something that I want to uh, point out to you here, this mathematics is extraordinarily powerful. Um, there are cameras out there that can actually take pictures of light that is being refracted around a corner. Ask me about that in class. That's pretty cool technology. All right. Um, now, as I said, the size of the object and the wavelength of the light gives us kind of a hard limit. So if we wanted to see things such as molecules, we have to go way, way down even smaller. And so here we can go into the X-ray range. The problem with X-rays is their wavelength is so small that we can't use a glass lens to bend the light. It would essentially absorb all of the light. So we don't really have any way of focusing this light, so we have to utilize different techniques. Um, one of those techniques is called X-ray crystallography. So if we take a bunch of something and form it into a crystal, which has it um, a bunch of repeating units in a particular pattern, we can shine X-ray through it. The light is going to be diffracted and create a particular pattern we can then utilize this mathematics to back calculate what the light must have passed through. Uh, so this provides a much more powerful technique uh, for delving deeper uh, down to a molecular level. We also have things called NMR. Um, we'll maybe talk about that in class. I'm not so interested that you understand that part. We will uh, pick up with electron microscope in part two.